thank you thank you thank you very much i'm just going to share my screen please let me know when you can see my screen can you see my screen yes we can yes all we right can. fantastic so um good afternoon everyone um i'm gonna try and rattle through um a few slides so please bear with me um as Emmanuel said, my name is Larry Lawali. I'm a facade engineer. I've been working for over 20 years in the facade industry. I'm presently based in Dubai. I work for Arup, a multi-engineering firm. And um, that's a, just a sprinkle of some of the projects. I thought I'd just show, give you a, a flavor and an example of some of the projects that I've worked on um, in my career. Um, the other HQ building in Abu Dhabi, the midfield terminal airport building in Abu Dhabi. I've just, I've just completed the design of the 300 meter tower in Dubai. That's what you see on the bottom left hand side called City Tower One. And very recently worked on a project in Lagos called the Jewel. I just thought I'll throw that in so you guys know that I haven't forgotten home. Um, so we are talking about um, energy efficiency in the built environment. And what is quite important for each and every one of us to start with is to grapple with what the, what the issues are. Um, what are we facing at the moment? The fact that um, many of us know that buildings consume up to 40% of, of the energy that we, we, we're producing at this point. It's a huge amount of energy um, not just the building itself, we're talking about from the production of the material right down to stripping the building or whatever, there's up to 40% being consumed by, by the built environment. And where we are at the moment is we're having a crisis with, with, the, with mother nature. Um, we're seeing that things are not working as they used to. Um, and we will all understand now that there needs to be a shift in our approach and our attitude um, to building, not just from a consumption perspective, but also from the efficiency of the building as well. So that when you were designing a building, what, what is it that you want to design as, as the, the person that owns or, or the custodian of, of the vision? Um, so we, we start by asking ourselves what an energy efficient building is. An energy efficient building, um, either a new construction or, or, or a renovated building um, that significantly has a reduction in the amount of energy that is needed in the heating or cooling of the building. That's what an efficient building is. So as I said, the spectrum is a bit larger than that. When we talk about energy efficiency, the built environment, the spectrum starts from the production of materials, not just the building itself, but the production of material to when we start stripping the building and we start to retrofit the building, what we call cradle to cradle. But from a building perspective, and that's what I'm going to be looking at today, the actual building itself, it's about essentially it's about the amount of consumption of energy to heat, to cool and to, to light the building. Um, in effect, um, that's what we're talking about when we actually are talking about um, energy consumption. Please bear with me. I'm going to try and rattle through this as quickly as possible so that other people have enough time as well. So what do we need to do in that space, um, especially as people that design buildings? So we need to reduce the demand of energy by avoiding waste and implementing energy saving measures. Um, use sustainable sources of energy when we are looking at our designs and what we're looking at, the type of energy the building is consuming. And we need to rely less on, on fossil fuel. But from a building design perspective and what we talk about when we say building, uh, efficient building itself, um, if you start to break it down into what the building requires, it's about the and efficiency of the building, how efficient are is the facade of the building because that's the biggest area of the building that gets compromised when it comes to energy efficiency. It's about the amount of air we either pumping into the building to cool it or the amount of heat we're pumping into the building to reduce the amount of cold air that is inside the building. So very important that the building is well insulated. Um, air tightness is important. So when we are designing buildings, we need to start thinking about air tightness testing for buildings. And I think these are things that we're going to have to discuss at later stages, but um, not at this time, um, air tightness of buildings, how we ventilate the building as well, because an efficient building needs to ventilate itself as well. And then we start talking further down the line about what the equipment that we're using to cool the building is, how much 
how much is that equipment consuming? How much energy does it save? And then we can start to talk about down the road, um, net zero, zero energy, um, using renewable energy on buildings, including turbines on buildings, buildings using photovoltaics to generate energy so that the amount of energy they're generating is, is almost exceeding the amount of energy they're consuming from the grid. So things like that are issues that need to be kind of discussed down the line. But I think for the purpose of, of today, uh, and what I've been asked to talk about is energy efficiency from a non-Nigerian perspective. And I'm not going to really focus on, on looking at the particular design design tricks in, in a building. I want us to look at it from an, an overview of how um, or what it is exactly we are doing in that space as Green Building Council. So when we talk about what is happening in other spaces, one of the first questions, especially in Dubai here, that um, working with the, with the government, what we've had to ask, the questions we've asked are, um, why are we doing this? And many of us on, I've, I've, I've talked about why we're doing it. We're doing it to save the planet. We're doing it so that we're living a planet that is better for the future generation. And what are the objectives and what are the targets? Those are very, very key things. We know why we're doing it. And then we set ourselves objectives and targets. Um, a variety of objectives and targets have been set in so many forums, COP being one of the forums where objectives and targets um, have been set. And when you then distill it down from what the targets are and each country goes away with their targets, they start to think, okay, what are the tools we need to be able to achieve this objective? So today I'm going to be talking about some tools that are being used. I'll focus really on some tools that are being used out here in Dubai. And once you move away from what those tools are, then we start to talk about measurements because there's no point putting put in targets in place and you're not able to measure that you are meeting those targets, there's absolutely no point in doing that. So one of the tools that we use in Dubai is called the Al Safat. And for many that don't know what, what this is, it's a base building, um, is a theoretical base building that has been designed. And that theoretical base building is is what forms the basis by which every other building is judged. So, uh, for example, this base building has information about water consumption. It has information about, about energy consumption of a building. It has information about sustainability. How much sustainability criteria do you have in your design? It has information on the amount of insulation you have in your building. It has information about U values, G values for the calculation of, of um, cooling plants. It has information about your roofing. Um, what kind of percentage of open area do you have to opaque areas? It goes as far as having information about whether you have the color on your building is reflective or not because the more reflective it is, the less heat it is absorbing. So that base building there forms the basis by which every building that is designed in Dubai um, is judged. And um, there are some key sustainable areas of focus that this, this Al Safa tool focuses on. Uh, it focuses on areas like ecology and planning. It, it talks about plants, how many plants do you have in the area? If you're uprooting plants, are you replacing them? Um, it talks about the kind of plant. There are endangered species that you cannot use in buildings, um, for example. Um, it talks about the, the, the building in terms of building vitality. It talks about massing. It talks about orientation. Um, what's the building orientation? Um, where's the sun? Where is it rising? Where is it setting? How does that affect the building occupiers and the users of the space? Um, and, and one of the key things is looking at the position of your bedrooms and where the sun is rising. You don't want the sun to be rising too early in the bedrooms because people are still sleeping. You want the sun to be in a less dominant area at, at different times of the day um, so that you're using less energy in certain areas of the day. Um, it talks about the con efficiency of the building. It talks about resources in terms of water, energy, and then it talks about waste. Um, so these are all criteria that are used um, in the Al Safa to judge the building. So that what happens is once you have designed your building, you have to go into this, big um, this Dubai municipality application and you have to submit your design. You have to put all your rating criteria in there. And from that, 
it, it comes out to tell you whether or not you're satisfying the base requirement. And this base requirement is called a bronze base requirement, which means it's the lowest requirement really. And you must satisfy that. And every building since 2016 in Dubai, most satisfy that base requirement. And then from there, you start to have one star rating, two star rating, three stars, four stars. And very recently, the government has, has introduced a four star rating. And I'll talk to you about that um, shortly. And again, as I was saying, it, it's been since 2016, and new buildings must meet the minimum of the bronze. And you've got the silver, the gold, and the platinum. And then you've got the four-star rating that has just been recently introduced. So this Al-Safat appli um, application is really to, to encourage the investors, it encourages owners of buildings and developers to ensure that they're applying a, a standard. There's a minimum and a base standard to which every building must comply to. Um, it's not everybody can just throw in any building they want and comply with it. No, we, there's a set minimum standard. Now, if you want to achieve a three, four star, well, all good, because that then what it is, is you're aspiring for a building that eventually your operational expenditure may be less than other buildings. But as a basis to ensure that there's consistency in Dubai, the, um, the Al Safat produce is the base by which every building is judged. And the, the implementation of this is, is been seen to achieve up to 34% energy saving so far um, in Dubai. Now, we talked about, I spoke about targets earlier on about the fact that we need to have targets for us to be able to know what we're, what we're achieving and for us to be able to measure if we're being successful. So target reductions under Royal Safad is for there to be a 15% water reduction, 20% uh, electricity reduction, um, CO2 emissions, 20% reduction, and then waste up to 50% reduction. And we know that landfill sites are, are becoming overused nowadays, and it's important that we reduce the pressure on, on landfill sites. But what is key in all of this is for the government to be able to say, we want to achieve a 15% reduction in water, for example, they must have a baseline from which they're measuring what that 15% is. So what is important for us as, uh, as, uh, as Nigeria, as a country, is, is looking at what we do going forward and what is, the, what is it that is that base design that we start to measure from? What are we measuring from? Do we have these base designs that we're measuring from for us to be able to be able to impose these targets on designers, investors, developers, and, and, and so on. Again, um, there are certain directives that have been coming out. So for example, we've been told that they anticipate uh, 7.3 metric tons of reduction over the next five years. That starts by 2021 because there's, there's a way by which these things are measured. Um, planting, there's, there's a significant increase in the number of trees that are being planted. Um, now more than 90% of buildings constructed since 2001 already meet the criteria because again, what is happening in this space is building owners are now being encouraged. Buildings that were constructed before 2016, they, they were being encouraged to kind of go back into the buildings and retrofit their buildings to meet this base requirement. Um, and 1,433 green building projects have been completed since 2010. So as you can see, um, there's, there's a lot that is happening in the space over here um, as regards green building and what the Emirates Green Building Council have been doing. And more recently, um, as I said, we've now introduced what is called a four-star rating for, for sustainability, higher sustainability um, ratings. That's not to say that there wasn't sustainability ratings in the Al-Safat before there was, but there's a new tool that is coming out now. When the the Al-Safat measures your, your designs, this new tool, and unfortunately, uh, I'm not in a position to share sensitive information about it because we're in talks and development with uh, Dubai Land Department about this tool. 
Um, but what this tool is, is about now is about the constructed, the existing building. While our SAFAT is about information on your design and what your building is expected to achieve, now we have a tool and we're coming up with a tool that is going to be measuring the existing building. And what it is now is that the Dubai government have surveyed all the plots of land in Dubai. Um, there are about 18,000 high-rise buildings in Dubai. And um, this is a newspaper clipping that I cut out and I hope um, it just gives a bit more information about it. Um, we've surveyed about, the gov Dubai government have surveyed about 18,000 buildings and assigned a rating to each building. So each building has been surveyed based on a criteria of about 94, up to about 90 questions or so um, that each they methodically answered for each building. Buildings like um, exit point, fire exit, um, do you have fire exits in your building? Um, uh, things like double glazing. Do you have double glazing in your building? Simple things that we, that we take for granted in some of our designs, but these are now the tools that are used to judge buildings now. And what is happening in this space now is this 18,000 buildings are all star rated. And each building owner, each building developer has access to this information. Now, this tool is going to be rolled out in such a manner that it's going to affect the building industry out here. It's going to affect the insurance industry out here as well, because insurance companies can now leverage this tool to set your premiums. So if your building has materials in your building that are combustible materials, Insurance buildings now know that they need to charge a higher premium because your building is a most is a building that is susceptible to flaming. But from the efficiency part of it, not just the insurers, from the efficiency part of it is about energy, energy and water usage by each building, by each occupier of your high rise. And each occupier now has a we in Nigeria, we have what is called our power holding authority. Out here, we have what is called uh, DIWA, uh, Dubai Electricity and Water Authority. So each apartment has its own number. And what this is, each num apartment is going to be measured. And we already do that anyway. And for building owners who have overall building consumptions or who have ratings that are not high enough, uh, they will not be able to charge premium rent going forward. So this thing is, this tool is going to be used in so many areas, not just in the energy efficiency sphere, but it's going to start to dictate who is allowed to increase rent and who is not allowed to increase rent. If your building is just a base one star, two star rating, the amount of rent you're allowed to charge will be less than a building that is a four plus star rating. And it's things like that that are coming into play. And they're trying to use this to force building owners to start to look at their building. And this is about building owners now beginning to retrofit their buildings to ensure that this 18,000 stock of buildings that we have in Dubai, that each and every one of them is beginning to look at those buildings, look at how energy efficient they are, look at the facades, look at the roof and get the right consultants in to start to advise them on whether or not they need to upgrade the walls, what they need to do to the walls. Is it increased insulation they need to do? Do they need to change the glass with better performing glass? So that from, a, from an energy performing um, aspect of the building, we start to get buildings that perform a lot better than they were performing before. And when you get a building that is that is a lot more airtight, that is a lot more insulated, you are using less energy to cool your building down. You know, the building I stay in out here, um, my wife is always complaining that it's it's too cold because once you put the AC on um, for a short while, this building traps that cold air for a long time. Um, you could put the AC on in the morning, switch it off, and up till night, the building is still cool because it is well insulated. So that my energy bill, um, while it's not at the point I want it because I, I like cold a lot, I can measure my energy bill and I can see what it is I'm doing, see how it's performing. I can, I can do that now via the energy bill that I'm given, but I can also go onto this new government website and look at my bill, my room, my house, and say, how am I performing? from an individual point of view, the building owner can look at it and say, how is he performing from a building point of view?
So it's a tool that is going to change building energy efficiency going forward um, in the Middle East. I'm mindful that of time. And um, as I said, there's, there has to be a, a way to measure as well. And one of the ways we measure, this is my electricity and water bill, for example, you can see on the screen. Um, as I said, I'm still using a lot more energy. But what the government has done is to take the initiative to say, this here is the base building. Yeah, For average homes that are in my area around the size of my house, this is the consumption for each one of them. This is my home. I'm over consuming energy. And then I start to think about it from my own personal point. How do I, as an individual, because so often we say it's the, it's the designer, it's the builder, it's, it's this person. Those are the people that are responsible. But the government now is now saying, let's bring the responsibility starting from the end user and say, this is what you're using. How can you do better? From the water, from usage of water, this here, the 597 is the average. I'm using less than the average which means I'm performing very well there. But well, other houses in my area um, are using over double. So I can say, okay, from the water perspective, I'm doing well, but from the energy electricity perspective, I'm not doing well. Does it mean I'm leaving certain electrical items on in my house that I should switch off so that there's a less demand on the power grid when it comes to my energy usage? So things like that are the things that are in play out here in, in Dubai. So it's not just about the building, con the guy that is designing or constructing the building. It goes back to the guys that are using the buildings as well. And I, I know my time, I probably used enough time. So I'd I just like to thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you and I hope that we can dive into further conversations at a later date. Thank you very much. Wow. Larry Lawali, this is um, an extensive um, learning class about um, what to be done uh, as a person, as an occupant, and of course also the government. I think the chilling part for me is how much responsibility um, have been taken up by the government of Dubai. And I'm sure in this and years to come, um, the dividends of these uh, interventions will be seen and visible. I think I also like the, the analytical part where they, they went around to go and survey how the vacant land and from there start making projections towards knowing how to undo um, days and time to come. Thank you very much for sparing, um, for sparing you. your time with us. I'm Thank sure you. we have question rolling in already, but we won't go to the question yet until we have Akita Antonio Koye present to us. Akita Antonio Koye, I read his profile earlier, for people that are coming shortly after the um, seminar commences, you might have to go to our LinkedIn page to read about him because we want to do that again because of our time. So you have the floor, you have 15, 20 minutes. I'm sure everybody's eager and waiting for you. Of course, primarily because you're also one of the key contributor that developed the present BEC code that we use in Nigeria. So we are, we are trying, because we have seen from the global, global perspective, we have seen what the government of the Middle East is doing. We're also now trying to want to now see what has been done um, and what can be improved upon. So sir, you have the floor for the next um, couple of minutes. Thank you very much for spending your time. So you can go ahead and unmute your mic. Uh, I think your mic, your mic is still, yes, you have the floor now. You can also go ahead and share your slides. Please, if you have questions, do well, not put it on the comment section, put it on the Q&A section so that it will be easier for us to identify the questions. And um, I'm sure our panelists are waiting and they have um, answers for us. Thank you very much. You can go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much, um, Architect Faludi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I'm just um, about to get my screen in place so the slide can roll. Um, um, like Architect Faludi has said, um, I'm an architect and um, urban designer. But the, um, are you guys see my screen? Not yet. Oh. Not yet. Oh, yes. I think I'm good to go. We can see your screen now. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to. Slide on, slide um, view. 
Yeah, I'm trying to get the slide view, but it's, it's hanging. It's, um, uh, one minute. That's fine, sir. Um, Are you seeing it? Are you able to see it now? Yes, we are seeing the slide, but not the slide only, not the slide only view. So you might want to from the beginning. Yes, you might want to do that. Yes, from the beginning. I think that would that okay. should work. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for having me. It's a pleasure. I'll be coming to this whole build um, green design and um, the uh, sustainability issue has come a long way. I was fortunate to, at an early stage, work with, um, firstly in Nigeria, Godwin and Hopwood, who, as we know, we are the, um, we are focused in tropical architecture, you know, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So that gave me a very good background. And when I went to the UK to study in Edinburgh, I was fortunate to work with um, Sir Frank Nair's associate, who was a um, collaborator with uh, Patrick Geddes. As you know, Patrick Geddes is the founder of um, town planning. So, and then moving to the US, I worked with uh, Wallace Roberts and Todd. Uh, one of the founders of Wallace Roberts and Todd is um, Ian McHugh. He um, wrote the seminal book of uh, Design with Nature. And um, he was a professor in Harvard. So he and his Harvard colleague founded Wallace Roberts and Todd. And through their career, which I benefited from, um, ecology, energy efficiency, you know, were, were the hallmarks of their practice. Um, and my firm in the US, virtually all of us, we are green certified very early on. I, I was certified that uh, I think it was 2004. And coming back to Nigeria, I just said, okay, I need to play some role in, in this. So I got really interested. Um, developing um, back, I was fortunate to, Arup invited me to join their team uh, with the German government and European Union. Um, the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing to develop um, the Building Energy Efficiency Guideline, which, which is the basis for uh, BEC. So my scope is, BEC is essentially for energy efficiency. Um, Larry had taken us through a global picture where you have energy efficiency being one component. You also have water and resources, you have um, wastes and other aspects of green design. So this code does not cover those aspects. This code is limited to just energy efficiency. And for us, it was to be a first step. You know, in Nigeria, if you make it too complicated initially, people will not buy into it. So this was um, essentially to get people interested and to um, start the move towards a broader scope of green design. Um, the, so I'm gonna show, so this presentation is focused um, in depth on the building energy efficiency code. You know, um, so they essentially, the code was designed such that if you implement it, you'll be able to save 40% of your energy usage. Part of, part of the problem in Nigeria is that we don't have enough power. And then we have buildings. So the strategy um, was to say, okay, if we can use the small what we have efficiently, then it will go a long way towards, you know, getting to more people. So, so that was a bit, that was a concept, you know, because you don't have you have insufficient power. If we design efficiently, 
we save enough to get around to more people. So that's really the concept. I mean, other countries have sufficient, but they're trying to reduce their usage, but we don't have enough. So by designing energy efficient buildings, we're able to you know, spread it to more people. The, um, back, there are several stages of this development. The first was to, to have a conceptual framework, which uh, the Building Energy Efficiency Guideline provided. We looked at um, the design process. You know, for you to achieve um, green design, there's this, the, the, the process is not linear. They call it the interactive design process. We are at the beginning of the project. All the consultants come together, the M&E, the structural engineer, the architects, you all come together to form like a workshop in Sharet to brainstorm on um, the project, which is different from the traditional method where the architect finishes, passes it on to the engineer, and then it goes on out like that. So, but, so the interactive design process was advocated and then there was a strategy, which is pyramidal in structure. At the base of that pyramid is the bioclimatic architecture, which is passive energy design. Then above that pyramid, you have used the use of mechanical and electrical efficient systems. At the top of the pyramid is where you have the renewables. And it actually goes from the base to the top in order of importance. We found that by doing steps one and two, you could save 40% of your energy. Then the renewable part can be like an icing on the cake. So the, that was, so the back was now based on those, the first and the second stage of that pyramid. Um, the aim was to set minimum standards of building and ensure the implementation, control, and enforcement. You know, Nigeria is always difficult to implement, control, and enforce. Even the current planning regulations we have, we, have, we find it very difficult to implement. So this kind of envisage that problem and try to solve it. You know, BEC consists of the following elements. Minimum standards for building, calculation methods and tools, then you have the energy label. Like if you, um, there, are, there are two ways you can go about achieving back, which I'll get to shortly. Um, but this, I'll tell, first talk about the building that it affects. Initially, the plan was for residential buildings, but was expanded to include um, offices. And these are classified as groups B and R in the Nigerian building code. It also covers buildings owned by the federal government and state governments, and of course the private sector ones. Initially, um, the, um, it's gonna be voluntary for the first two years. After the first two years, it's gonna become mandatory. So as you're getting your planning approval, you'll be required to get your, your in fact, your planning approval should, should ensure that you know, it, it includes back. So that's what the government is doing. So the government is going around the state government now. They've done, they've, um, done the one in Plato, um, in Plato State. Yeah, the one in Lagos State was held some few weeks ago. And so the idea is that the state government will adopt back and make it part of their planning approval process. Um, so the... So there are two methods um, which you use to verify whether you've complied with BEC. The first method is the prescriptive method. In the prescriptive method, you know, there's a baseline. That baseline, um, you, uh, uh, and a checklist. So that checklist, uh, once you comply with those elements, for instance, your window ratio, Window to wall ratio and the rest, you take it off and it goes on till you've met all the requirements. 
but there's also the performance method. In the performance method, you're, you've deviated from the prescriptive method. In the performance method, you use simulation of the building using simulation tools that are certified by um, ASHRI and other such um, bodies. Um, so one of the, so I'm gonna talk very quickly about the prescription method, the prescriptive approach. The wall to window ratio and shading is fundamental in that. So the window wall ratio should not exceed 20%. And where this is exceeded, you have to show that you have enough glazing to provide shade. The whole, the whole idea here is to prevent solar heat gain into the building. You know, so, so to, up to, to check this at the design stage, you need to get, an, you get approval. So you, you bring your drawings with your window schedule, your calculations to show that you've met that ratio. So that's ticked off. After the building is constructed, you come back again and they will check that again to make sure you've come, you still, still kept what was approved at the design stage. Then the other element um, is lighting. The lighting power density should not exceed six watts per square meters for residential buildings and eight watts per square meters for offices. And this is calculated against the gross floor area of the building. And we advise to use um, energy efficient um, light fittings. Then for verification, you have to show um, your lightning layouts, the product um, manuals and all that before it can be approved. The third element is the roof um, because a lot of heat comes from the roof. So they've proposed to have a minimum, um, a layer of insulation with thermal resistance of not less than 1.25 meters squared per kilowatt. Um, not spa, um, that's an error value of 1.25. And again, covers all buildings. So these are the prescriptive ones. So if, if your building has this insulation, you check that off. If it has the, um, the wall to floor area that is less than 20%, you check that off. If it has um, the lighting that meets the requirements, you check it off. Then, Lastly, is the air conditioning for this method. All the conditioners um, shall have a minimum of energy efficiency ratio um, of 2.8 um, um, and all air conditioners should be of the inverter type. You know, and not um, inverter types are going to be discouraged in future. Um, then the second method is the performance approach. This one, you have to get a model, um, a software that does simulation. And then you ensure that it gives you an energy use that is less than that you achieve through the prescriptive method. So the prescriptive method forms the baseline where you model your building using these tools. It should be less than the energy or less than or equal to the reference building designed in accordance with the prescriptive requirements. And okay, simulation is also done twice. Um, your design building and the second one is on, um, on the prescriptive one. Um, but they have a calculator which enables you to cal calculate all the requirements for both methods. They call, it's called the Beck calculator. Then to encourage um, the use of this tool, they are, um, Beck is um, encouraging some labels. 
just to give you some incentives. Um, so labels shall be awarded to the building owner, you know, a certificate of unit certificate of use and habitation. Back label rates the building on how many of the back interventions that um, you've adopted. So the highest back um, rating is four star, but if you've gone way above that, yeah, you'll be given a five star rating. So this table here shows um, the various ratings. So if you've just done the wall to um, window to wall um, intervention, you get a one star. If you've done the window to wall and actually done the lightning part, you get a two star. If you've done the window to wall lightning for both offices and residential, you get a three star. So it goes on like that, you know. So when you, when you meet all the requirements of the various elements, including the air conditioning, you get the four star. But the five star rating is given to is by application only. This shows that taking into account renewable energy systems, um, solar panels, water heating, which are currently outside BEC. Then this is, and so this is one for the performance. This is when you use your, um, your simulation tools. And so you're also giving them rating based on the amount of energy um, you've been able to save. At the end of the day, you're given a label like this. Each of the various state governments will develop theirs. So the label will talk about the state, the type of building, the date was issued, the owner, and the back reference number. Then it can be a one to five star, like we discussed earlier. Um, control and enforcement. Verification documents are usually submitted, and then the authorities that have um, control will verify all those documents. So they will check it at the design stage, and they check it at the point of occupation. And these are by the staff of the uh, relevant authority. Then they also try to develop qualification for best experts. Which I think everybody, a lot of people should be looking into this, uh, those in the building industry. Because at some point, only those experts will be allowed to make these submissions. Um, so the expert must have a BSc in building, architecture, or engineering, and then go through the BEC training and certification. So the BEC is designed to be reviewed periodically every two months, every, every um, two years first, then, every, then three to five years is reviewed and um, improved upon. So the BEC now is it's called one BEC 1.0. When is the minor improvement is 1.1. When is the major improvement once BEC 2.0. So these are the various um, annexes that um, it contains. You know, the BEC calculator, the BEC modeling protocol, and then there's the change log. So that's essentially, it's, um, the conclusion of my presentation. As I said, it's focused essentially on Beck. So it's a bit more technical than, um, I think the first presentation has given us all the principles and a broader view of um, green architecture. So mine is essentially on the Beck Nigerian Building Efficiency Code. Thank you. Wow. Such a great one, sir. Thank you so much for your time. I think that's a Koye. Thank you. I'm sure we have learned um, what has been done because a lot of persons have thought we are doing nothing in Nigeria, but that's not true, depending on where you sit. So this is um, one of the ongoing and in fact already deployed intervention because one of the goals um, that we have for setting up this webinar is to have an history of this BEC code and see where as a 
renal body and as individual can recommend for improvement. Of course, because there is an improvement path for this code, which he stressed at the closing, um, as one of his closing remark. Thank you very much, sir, um, for your time. Then let me also mention, there is um, a membership route um, to become a member of Green Building Council of Nigeria. I think uh, briefly, I will, I, before we go to the panel session, I will allow our president, because I'm not sure the director of member is visible here yet. Maybe I will allow him to just talk briefly, one or two minutes to talk about the route to becoming a member of Nigeria Green Building Council. Of course, and also in the meantime, I also would want to acknowledge um, some uh, uh, individuals in the industry, uh, uh, industry captain in Nigeria that, that have been part of this seminar. I've seen um, architect, architect Briggs um, from NIA Lagos, we welcome you. I've also seen um, Dr. Let me check one more time. I think I see. I also see architect Adeleke Adeala from, I think he's also a member of NIA. Thank you, you're welcome. I also see Dr. Femi Balogun, the NIQS um, director of, uh, I think, college, the training college. Doctor, welcome on board. So while um, I'm welcoming them, I also want to have the president just comment one or two minutes on the um, becoming a member of Nigeria Gibraltar Council. And of course, also if you ask comments on the presentations, before we move to, move to the panel session. Uh, okay, go ahead, minute, um, I, um, at the Faluday, it's just, uh, I don't know, can you still see my screen? Mm, well, not, we are seeing your screen, but not presentation mode, um, not the slide. We are seeing your, your files. And, I, um, I, can you see any building on my screen? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I was, I was about to show um, a building that the president and myself worked on, um, the Galaxy Backbone um, headquarters in Abuja. So that's an interesting building where we try a lot of passive energy um, um, measures deployed, like so. we are deployed, you know, and even the insults. But anyway, that could be shown another time. Thank you. Okay, so, okay, the president is um, requesting that we come to this at the end. So at the end of the webinar, we'll be discussing how to become members. And of course, we know that everybody in attendance, we have their emails, we have your emails. We're also going to send to you um, the link to some of this information that has been general. So I think without further ado, we can move quickly to the panel session. Okay, that's the building in question. So I think we can see it now. Yeah. We can see it now. So that's the Galaxy Backbone headquarters in Abuja. Okay, very well. It has, it's, you can see the solar shading. It has a courtyard, but um, this is another view of it. So the president and myself, we are consultants on this. Oh, it's a great one. Yeah, so there's several other ones which we've um, done. Um, this is the SEC building in um, zonal office in Ibadan. You know, you can see the courtyard that's covered, the window uh, rotation of buildings away from the sun. Is another view of it. Um, the Leap Africa headquarters, um, solar shading in place. So there are quite a couple of um, the latest one we're working on is in the, with the, um, okay, this is Bell Point in Lucky here. For us, it's um, the, the nature is the green. The minimum is passive energy. Um, the Edo, Edo Tech Park, it's, um, which I'll get to now, is the latest one. We are working with the Edo State Government to develop the park. And um, it's going to use Beck um, you know, as part of um, a part of it. So it's yeah, it's um, okay. This is some of the technology projects we've done, master plans. But the, I'll get to yeah, this is the Dotec Park, you know. So it's going to use a Beck, one of the first projects to to deploy Beck. You can see oh, the solar, um, the solar panels on the roof, the gray roof. 
um, that's some of the spaces within it. Um, okay, so that's that in a nutshell ends my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you. We appreciate your time with us. Um, I think from here we can move to our um, question and answer session. Of course, on board at this stage is also Vera. She's um, I've spoken about her before. Someone is raising up her hand. Okay, very well. Um, Mr. Babasunde Badru, you can just drop your question because we are just mindful of time. We, should, we have about, I think, barely 20 minutes more. If you, you can ask a question, you can chat us up privately to ask a question. We'll be willing to answer. Um, and if we have more time, we can come to you to ask interesting question. But I think from here, we can move on to our question and answer. So I think I'd, I want to start from where to answer a question that was asked on the group. Someone is asking about um, the Green Building Council of Nigeria, if we have affiliation to USGDC and if there are plans on, on getting accreditation from a recognized body like USGBC, maybe the best way to frame it. Okay, of course, I think I will allow Brett to answer this, but the best way to, to have frame this question would have been is the GBCN or GBC Nigeria affiliated to World Great Building Council because USGBC is an equivalent of Nigeria Green Building Council. So we are USGBC and Green Building Council of Nigeria, we are an equivalent. Maybe the right question to ask is, do we have yeah. affiliation to the World Green Building Council? So there, I think this yes. is your question. You, you can shoot from here. All right, thank you. Just a note that the screen is still being shared. So I don't know if it's possible just so that I can see everyone on my side, because I just see the presentation. So I'm not sure if there's a way to stop with the screen sharing. Okay, we can, yes. Thank yes. you, yes, I love to see faces. So this is great. Um, hi everyone, and it's such an honor to be here. So hi to every person who's attended. And also thank you so much to the presentation um, for the presentations that happened before um, Lanre and, and Anthony. I think every single person in this room has learned so much. And I think even beyond that, it goes to show that from within Nigeria and Nigerians, whether or not you're in the diaspora or in the country itself, there is a lot of a contribution that is going to be coming from Nigeria when it comes to the discourse around green buildings across the world. Um, to answer the question around whether or not the Green Building Council Nigeria is affiliated to the United States Green Building Council, I'll take a bit of a step back and introduce myself. So I'm the head of Africa programs from the World Green Building Council. And as Africa and the Africa Regional Network, we actually have um, 10 registered Green Building Councils in Africa. And then across the world, we've got 70 Green Building Councils. To put that into perspective, it means that you don't have to be affiliated to the United States Green Building Council. That's one of 70. Green Building Councils, um, and it is the equivalent. So the Green Building Council in Nigeria is actually the equivalent of the United States Green Building Council. So the equivalent of the UK Green Building Council, the equivalent of South Africa Green Building Council. Um, and the whole aim of the Green Building Council in Nigeria is to contextualize what green buildings will look like in Nigeria, what the context is across the region, um, your population is quite large. You've got different climatic zones, different geographic zones. And so that's why I think I even put it in the chat to encourage every single one of you to be a member of your local Green Building Council because it is internationally recognized. Um, and the aim is to have the international recognition, but to have the local context and to really understand what green buildings means for Nigeria in that context. Um, so I hope that that answers the question. But I, as an African, I'm so absolutely excited um, to see so many people here on a Saturday afternoon. This would never happen in South Africa. Um, but so many people on a Saturday afternoon, because we want to talk about green buildings, we want to be able to address energy efficiency in buildings, because Africa is the most you know, vulnerable continent when it comes to climate change and buildings are a critical climate solution. It consumes 40% um, of, of energy consumption. And so if we can solve the buildings 
issue, then already we're trying to solve climate change. So well done to the Green Building Council of Nigeria for this great event. Um, and thank you to every single one of the speakers before. I've learned so much and I think every person has as well. Very well, thank you, Vera. Thank you for your time. Um, I think the next question here, we'll go to architect Larry. Someone is asking here, let me check quickly, that, um, okay, person is asking that he, um, that he is interested in learning more about um, green building envelope, Okay, I think let's, let's start from this question. I couldn't see that question again. I, I, I guess it was pulled up. Then the person is asking here, how was the survey of, of on buildings in Dubai done? Can the literature of the methodology and results be shared? Of course, um, before you answer that, someone also asked if our presenters could be um, magnanimous enough to release to us this slide. So I think, um, of course, is their property, intellectual property, is, is just to decide. So I think I will leave you with these two questions after Larry. Just go ahead, sir. Um, I'll answer the second one very quickly, and the answer is yes. Um, I would email the slide to either one of the executives of Beck, and then they can share it around. So that's the answer to the second one. To the first question, um, the survey took about five years to do, and it was um, done by individuals that were trained, it was thousands of people that were trained on going into buildings. Um, as you know, we have a, a pool or rather, uh, let me not say as you know, but we have a pool of information about drawing. So when buildings are designed out here, you need to submit your buildings um, to the Dubai municipality. So every building that is designed out here, there's information about your building when it comes to square area, the amount of flats you have in there, the plot size and a few other things. So all that was already available. But the questions that needed to be answered um, it was done by trained individuals that were trained um, by the Dubai Land Department. And these people um, were given the mandate to go into buildings and speak to building supervisors and facilities management, and as well owners of the building to get answers to all these questions. So that's how the survey was carried out. Um, as to whether there is a methodology that can be shared at this time, all the information relating to how this data is collated, what the data is and all of that, they're still confidential. Um, but at some point, it's going. we are going to be allowed to, to share this out. And once we're allowed to do that, I'll be more than happy to share, to share this with you guys as well. Manuel, I think you're on mute. Manuel, are you still there? I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, very well. Um, thank you for your response. Well, I think um, Ms. Jacqueline is also on board to join me at this panel session. So I think I will allow her to ask the next set of questions. Ms. Jacqueline, you can go ahead, Ma. Uh, hi, thank you so much, everyone, for all your contribution. Thank you, um, Emmanuel, for facilitating this. I'm just going to be taking the questions um, as they come in. Emmanuel has uh, he's, he's posed some of the questions, so I, I, will, I will start from uh, the bottom. And I think that this question is for Mr. Anthony, um, and it's from Ayodele Ikudaisi. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. And his question is: Do we do we uh, will we have well, do we have a building rated with BEEC in Nigeria? So is there a BEC rated building in Nigeria? Um, there are some pilot ones, yes, that um, the, um, you know, this uh, BEC is sponsored by the German government and the European Union. So there are some pilot projects they are currently uh, undertaking. Yes, but I could get that, yes, at some, um, the stage, I'm not sure whether they've completed them or, but there are some that are in, 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 um, in progress now. But so I can confirm from um, GIZ um, the status and get back. All right, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll be taking the next question. Um, and then again, this is um, to 
um, architect Okoye um, from Emmanuel Okoye. He says the architect Okoye said the qualification for being a DEC expert is uh, uh, a BSc in building architectural engineering. He says what about um, those with a BTEC or HND qualification? I'm sure they could. Be allowed, okay, Tony, I'm not sure if you got that. Yes. I, I got that, yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's as stated in the code, you know, it's essentially the BSc, but I'm sure um, you'll be able to, they should be able to allow um, HND person. But apart from that base degree, you're going to do some training. And after the training, you're going to do an exam. Before you can become a um, uh, a BB, BEEC um, expert, so I'm sure that they should be able to allow for that. But but this, the code just states um, a bachelor's degree. So, but that could be clarified yep. later. All right, thank you. Once we get that information, we can share with the person or with everyone who registered for for the event. Um, I have one question from Ibrahim Isa. Um, his question is, can the BEC calculator be shared with us? And, uh, Anthony, for you again. Yes, uh, um, the idea is to make it, um, um, make everybody have it. So there's a training that um, is currently, some, some are taking place in Lagos. I mean, some, I think maybe on Monday, Tuesday, we are after the training, of the code, um, the use of the code, you're given that, um, you're given the, um, the the tools necessary. So, so the idea is the, it'd be good to find um, where does the training is taking place, register for it. So after the training, you'll be given the tools. So, but we can forward that in the, oh. in our forum, the GBCN forum, just, um, Keep, keep um, checking our group um, uh, forum. Okay. Uh, okay. All information. Okay. Well, I have one more question for you. Uh, uh, there's a question that uh, has been asked. Uh, and the question is, what, um, what would you change or improve if you were to develop the BEEC today? Pardon? Sorry. Pardon? Can you repeat that, please? Right. The question was, what would you change or improve in the current BEC that we have today? Um, I mean, there's quite a lot to improve on it. First is, the scope is limited because our goal is towards um, green design and efficiency, like land race presentation showed. You know, we're still a long way from um, where Dubai is or the rest of the world is. So first you can add other dimensions out of scope um, so to it, um, water efficiency, waste management and the rest. But even as it is now, um, you notice that they never talked about the composition of the wall. Um, right now, they, they just mentioned window to wall ratio, but how about um, what should be the minimum thickness of the wall? What should the composition of the wall be to minimize heat gain into the building? So that's one area. So there are several areas to work with. Um, um, so several areas where we could, we could talk about it. Um, where could An improvement. Yeah. OK, super, super. This next question is for uh, architect Larry Lawale. And it's from Sunday David. He says, with BEC in focus, how suitable are sandcrete and concrete walls for a country like Nigeria in the heart of a tropical region? Uh, like Lanry, are you able to take mm. this? Um, yes, I can. Um, not very suitable. Um, as Mr. Koye was just mentioning, um, if you're looking for a wall that performs, there's a lot that goes into a wall that, that provides you with a thermal performance that enables you reduce the amount of energy you are consuming in the building. And just a sandcrete block wall um, is not enough. 
bearing in mind that um, we've got about a 200 to 25 millimeter thick block wall that is hollow in the middle of it, that doesn't have any mass whatsoever. Um, it does not provide you with any thermal performance whatsoever. So there needs to be a requirement for us to, as, as Mr. Kui said, to go back into our design of our building walls. What should be the minimum U value of a wall? We don't have to specify what the thickness is. We don't have to specify the materials that go into the wall, but we need to start specifying what the performance of that wall needs to be. And we need to start looking at tightening up U values of walls. Um, and I mean, we're designing walls that are U values of one or less nowadays. Um, and we have um, a zone for the wall of about 300 millimeters. So um, we can do it. It's just about going back and looking at the right design for our, our particular area. But again, going back to the, to the question, the answer is no. Um, just a simple sandcrete block wall is not suitable. Okay. okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I have a few more questions and I think that we can wrap up. Um, the next question um, is, I believe for, um, I mean, someone had asked earlier on, I think it was a phone show at Jani, she'd asked, or he, or she had asked to, um, for, for us to make available today's document. And I think that each participant can do that. I just wanted to confirm. So architect Lan Ray and architect Tony, are we able to make available our presentations to to the attend attenders of this um, um, um yes absolutely of this webinar? Yes. Okay, so super. So that's answered. Then she had a, all right, and she had another question, and she says also she says that that she would like to have a working document for the designer, the builder, and as well as a client. Uh, she thinks that that should be developed. I don't know if you have any. I don't know what your takes are on that. Do you want to respond to that? Do we have working documents? Um, Ver, I, Ver, is, I think Ver. Is, is, is it for the BEC or what? Uh, can I just get Ver to just respond uh, and then I'll come back to you, Mano. Um, I think that's okay. I think that's where it really highlights the value of the Green Building Council in Nigeria. Um, so in terms of the, the working documentation, some of the presentations, um, it's always great to see the Green Building Council kind of being that focal point because as the BEC continues to evolve across the country, I think every person in this room will really be able to give a contribution um, towards that. So that's really what I wanted to just note is to say those kind of the working documentation, the, the intersectionality between the different engineers and architects and consultants is really going to make a difference in terms of continuing to develop the, the strength of the BEC. Um, that's what I wanted to add, Jackie. Thank you so much for that, Vera. Thank you. I'm just going to jump to the next question. Um, someone is asking if we're in some way, it says, um, mm, okay, it says there's a Green Building Council affiliated with Arkan and other professional bodies in Nigeria. Um, Emmanuel or yes. Dr. Wanico? Oh. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I would like to attempt that. Yes, of course, we. For instance, I'm sure a lot of us here, we are either account licensed or we are registered QS. So the, the, the membership of Nigeria, Nigeria Green Building Council is open to all. It's not like it's focused on architects or, or engineers as well, but we have understanding also with these bodies. For instance, now um, we have Dr. Femi Balogun here, who is the head of the Academy of NIQS. In fact, my we have the instruction of the president to also let him um, have a comment, one or two words concerning the webinar that we just had. And also, we also have architect um, Briggs Lina here. She's is also going to have a word with us. He's also the, I'm aware that is the current NIA um, president of the Abuja chapter. So, vitally, we work together with all professional bodies in Nigeria. And of course, we are drawn from all these bodies and um, evidence in our attendance and in our membership class uh, um, is this truth. So I don't know what, while if we don't have any other question or maybe at the end of question, we can also allow um, both of them to make a comment or if they have any contribution um, in respect of right. this conversation, yes. 
uh, I think um, that, that, that was it more to let, the, to let other participants oh, okay. see that we're working together. All right, so we'll be doing that. I'm just going to go because we have so many questions, but I'm going to try as much as possible to just summarize all of them. And so maybe three more questions to just go over and then we can wrap it up. Um, there's a question um, from Greg. He says in the presentation, a lot was said about new builds. Can a building that is um, to be extensively renovated benefit from the BEC compliance? If so, how does one go about it that designs it? Uh, Mr. Larry, um, architect Larry, do you want to take this question? And then maybe Mr. Tony also can um, say okay. something about this. All right. Um, I can talk from my perspective and my understanding. I do a lot of retrofitting of building facades. And yes, um, there is a lot to be said for retrofitting and how you go about retrofitting and what is possible to be able to do with retrofitting. Um, some buildings are designed to the, to the plot boundaries, so you cannot increase the thickness of the wall. And building owners will not allow you to take the wall a bit further inside because you're reducing letable space. Um, of their building because obviously letable space is calculated based on the area of the floor. But there is a lot that can be done in the retro, retrofit space. There's a lot of materials that are out in the market now that are high performing materials, vacuum insulation, for example, where you don't need a hundred millimeters of space for insulation anymore. You can use a 25, 30 millimeter thick insulation, but it's more expensive. So there's a lot in that space that can happen in the retrofit business. Um, it's just looking for the right solution, looking for the, the right design approach uh, to, to be able to resolve the difficulties with retrofitting. The difficulty, that's on the facades of the building. The difficulties come into the mechanics of the cooling systems of the building. And when you're retrofitting, it's one thing to design the, the, the wall of the building um, to give you the right level of um, exfiltration, infiltration, uh, air tightness, water tightness, and thermal performance. It's one thing. But the other side as well is to look at the performance of the mechanical cooling and the cooling plants in the building and what they need to achieve. And in many cases, a lot of building owners don't want to start stripping out <clears throat> finishes in their building to start changing um, cooling equipment. So the burden falls on re-insulating a number of all those cooling plants. It looks at, it looks at how you upgrade cooling plants as well and the spaces required for cooling plants so i think what is quite important and what is quite key in doing this is that you speak to the right consultants um, who can help you um, with the design um, for example there are lots of equipment out there that are booster equipment to mechanical equipment that, re that help to manage the output of energy that is going out through mechanical equipment now, someone that has that understanding and has that capability needs to be able to advise you on that, advise you on the kind of space allowance you need for, your, for that in a cooling area and what that does to maybe your service area, your, your floor spaces, et cetera. But there are people out there who can, who can um, help and advise you, but it, it's a bit more difficult, I agree, when you were dealing with retrofits than when you're doing new builds. Yeah, just to add a bit to that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, as you know, the, uh, the building energy efficiency code in Nigeria is essentially for new build. But there's room for, but other ones like um, lead in the US and other places, when you retrofit, it's one of those criteria where you're saving a lot of energy. Because what's, what's happening, instead of tearing down to build afresh, you're trying to, so they call, so they call it adaptive reuse. So that would just cause you a very high point because you're trying to adapt something instead of starting afresh. So you're saving a lot of energy in doing that. So in doing that as well, you're, you're changing the mechanical systems to more efficient ones. You're changing, um, you know, working on the walls to make sure that they comply. And um, so the mere fact that you're doing adaptive reuse, or even if it's just to renovate, but with uh, improvements to the mechanical systems, to the building materials, you know, is already a big plus. Um, as, so there's some rating agencies give you a lot of points for that. Um, and so even as people that are in, trying to design grid, that's it. you're encouraged to 
adapt instead of tearing down to start afresh. So, but the BEC for now does not um, allow that. I remember the, for especially for interiors, um, our office in the US then got the platinum rating for interior, lead platinum rating, because it's um, an existing office space. When we moved in, you know, we um, put all the green measures inside and um, it was, got the plat was one of the first interior platinum um, rated um, spaces. All right, thank you so much for your contribution, architect Tony. So I think that the, the, we had just two more questions. Uh, um, and I see one question that's kind of recurrent, but I would like for our uh, partners, you know, like ACON, the professional bodies, uh, representatives of ACON or, or NIA to respond on this one. And it was, the questions have been posed by Edafe Iwiwu and uh, Emmanuel Okorie. Basically, what is what the question is, or what the suggestion is? How can we? Um, so, for what we're talking about, this uh, the BEC, what uh, the Green Building Council of uh, uh, Nigeria is is trying to do? How will how will um, you know certifying buildings pan out? Would, would we will be running them independently, or or we will be running them uh, in partnership with other professional bodies so that? efforts are not being duplicated. Um, and uh, like Edafe stated, it says, uh, this is something to, to think about because a huge burden that we have with approvals, especially in Lagos, is a duplication of efforts as so many approval units and so many bodies. And, and he thinks that is a waste of resources. Um, so architect Tony, you probably also need to uh, say something um, about this. So I'm going to leave this question to when um, we, have, we have our partners uh, speaking. Um, well, there's one last question, and it's from Olatubos from Bankole. He says, is any license issued by the Green Building Council? What is the path and the process for acquiring such a, a license? Emmanuel, do you want to take this? Right. Um, yes, I can. So basically, there is a membership class system. Um, what we'll be doing at the end of this webinar, we're going to, since um, every, person, every person that attended, we have your emails. We will share with you our membership category. Of course, um, some of them are evolving, but there's an entry point and there's a form to fill and there are some basic requirements. So some persons on this platform are members, while some are basically um, enthusiasts. We have a forum where uh, members are being addressed and where we also share thoughts with them. And of course, even this webinar is being organized primarily for members and of course for the general um, built environment um, green building persons or green interested persons. So yes, there is a pathway to getting to be a member, becoming a member of Nigeria Green Building Council, either as, a, either as an individual or corporately. So the pathway will be shared with us in some of our subsequent email within the next couple of days. Um, of course, it's not a license. It's basically like an endorsement or um, maybe we can call it a credential. Of course, we are still fine-tuning some of the um, categories, but it's not a license. Um, maybe in that sense of um, ACON license or NIQS license, no, it's not. It's more of a credential that can let your client or your or the whole professional body knows how much of this um, knowledge you had acquired and how much you can do if they bring you in, into their space. So some of this will be mailed to us. Thank you for this question, um, Mr. Olatubosun Van Ojo. So can we move from here to just allow maybe closing remarks from our- uh... Yes. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. So, I wanted I to just we... encourage anybody who feels like they have more questions to just you know email us directly and we'll try as much as possible to, to respond to you. Over okay, to you, so... ma'am. Well, thank you, everyone. I think we also help us to okay. put in the chat box our email address for people to... Um, Absolutely, respond. I'll do that now. Please, thank you. So I think we should start from Dr. Fembalogun. Um, I know you have a thought. I know you want to share something with us. You can just go ahead and um, let's have you, sir. All right, thank you. I'm sure. Can you hear me? Yes, you are audible enough, sir. Yes, audible. I want to thank uh, the Green Building Council of Nigeria for a job well done. I'm really amazed. I'm happy and I uh, want to congratulate them and to wish them well. 
Thank I you. also want to thank uh, the presenters, uh, Actet uh, Lawale and uh, Actet Okoye. Uh, I've learned a great deal here today and uh, gladdens my heart that we have all these competencies uh, within the country. Uh, it, I am the DG Director General of uh, QS Academy. And uh, sometimes towards the end of last year, we, we organized a webinar too. Uh, which was on green, uh, green building and the county surveyor. And uh, uh, actor uh, Falude was one of our uh, resource persons. And even the president, too, uh, was there, too, as a resource person. Uh, I, I have a thought that uh, has been bothering my mind. Uh, I've listened to actor Lawale and I've listened to actor Okoye. And throughout their presentation, uh, there was no concrete uh, uh, mentioning of the cost implication of some of those uh, initiatives and decisions. Uh, Atalali talked about the reasons for uh, having an efficient building. He, he talked about uh, we, you know, saving the climate, uh, the, the, the climate in the, you know, contributing maybe too much carbon uh, to the atmosphere. Yes, of course, but uh, the, the, the science, uh, the background of this is still unfolding. It's not uh, definitive. Uh, a lot of challenges we have against this uh, science up to today. Uh, but something that is very concrete to us is uh, the cost that we feel in our pockets. You know, when you use uh, an inefficient uh, building, you, uh, in terms of uh, energy consumption, you feel the cost because you pay the bills, either the electricity bill, the water bills, and thereabout. So uh, I begin to see kind of uh, the impact of costing uh, uh, to support the design of energy efficient building. Uh, it, it, it gladdened my heart when I heard uh, actor Tokoye mentioning something like uh, integrated uh, design approach that uh, he is applying in his practice. And that is very key. So my thought is, uh, uh, what is the impact of the cost manager uh, within that system, that integrated uh, a design approach because we say integrated design approach is not just the architect uh, doing like we used to do before finish the design and give it to the MIE but that you work together but you didn't include the cost actually there should be a cost planning and my thinking I my, my thought is just not about Nigeria even the internationally I don't know whether they have some idea of a green cost planning. You know, I, I was thinking that since we have a traditional cost plan, then there should be a, a green too that could help because uh, life cycle costing, the, the cost we are talking about is cost in use. Uh, and this has to go with life cycle costing. There are some methodology of establishing life cycle costing. Uh, and the competency of these is, uh, is a warehouse in a profession, maybe country surveyor or cost manager. Is there no way, uh, and I'll ask the panelists, is there no way by which through this integrated design approach, you can bring the cost uh, managers in to, so that they'll be able to establish, particularly, I understand the uh, architect of Kui said that the BEC is about uh, uh, new building, but we also should have, uh, it on uh, retrofit, you know, and particularly in retrofit, where, where, where do we have uh, the existing cost? What is the cost that a building is destroying that we want to recoup so that through uh, efficient design of that building in retrofitting, then we can be able to have some advantage. I, I'm just trying to think that uh, a way where, where we can collaborate, all the professional bodies can collaborate uh, towards uh, achieving success. And it can even start in Nigeria. But 
I thank the two presenters. I learned a lot from their presentations, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you all. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Femi. I think this is your question can take us the next uh, Monday to answer. Of course, I will allow 30, 30 seconds comment from Akdet, um, Antonia, and Wali. But you know, um, vitally, what you just raised is, I think, is key at the moment because I recall that, for instance, in some part of Lagos, in the last one month, some estates have moved from 96 kilowatt hour power in their energy cost to about 140 kilowatt per hour. In fact, some estates have moved up to 180, double the energy cost in the last four weeks. So these costs um, matter both at the construction design stage and of course at operation stage is a big deal. And I mean a massive deal. I'm certain one hour is not enough to exhaust this. Hoping that uh, by the time we convey again, we might have something more robust to discuss on this matter. But of course, while I will not say let's convey to respond to you, I'll just have, um, avail like Anthony and like Lawali to give us 30 like, seconds response so that we can move. Okay. Thank you sir, for your time. All right, then just uh, a quick one. You know, the integrated design process is actually very, is, is a whole um, design team that are involved. So you have the QS, you have the, all the consultants are involved. The clients are also involved. All the, all the stakeholders at the, at the uh, initial stage. So it's not um, just limited to some few people. And so at that, at that stage, also doing your, your cost, initial costing. So there's that cost management as you progress through the design process. So, th so that's just the correction. Then increasingly, like you said, life cycle costs of buildings have actually shown the advantage of um, you know, building green. So I'll stop from, I'll stop there, thank you. All right, <clears throat> I just quickly answer. There's a question that you asked about um, what's the cost of us doing all this? The cost of us doing all this is the existence of every one of us um, remaining on planet Earth. That's the, that's the main cost of us uh, yeah. looking at energy efficiency um, in a building. But when we bring it down to the macro level, which is the building itself, I agree with you that we need to look at um, the efficiencies in costs right from where the materials are harvested from the ground, the embodied carbon, embodied cost, right up to the point where we strip the building and we retrofit it. Um, we're talking cradle to cradle, not cradle to grave anymore in terms of materials. And it's important for the cost consultant to be involved in this um, right from the point where the material starts being used right up onto the point where we're recycling the material. But what is very key in this is for us to understand that ultimately there's going to be one cost. There's not going to be a green cost for a building and other materials. The aim at the end of the day is that these green materials become the material that we are using on our buildings. It's no, it should no longer be a nice to have. It should be what is on our building so that the cost of the building is just that one cost, which is the, the material that is going onto the building. I, I hope I've answered a little bit of the question. Okay, very well, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. very, just to make a show. Yeah, please go yeah, ahead. I feel like that's such an interesting topic and to build on to what all the other presenters, um, presenters have said as well. If you look at it internationally, there is a green cost plan and I would almost encourage Green Building Council Nigeria, maybe this is the topic for your next webinar, is to really bring in the quantity surveyors, architects, engineers, and to have something around that. Um, internationally, there's also an ISO standard, which is ISO 15686. And that specifically looks at life cycle costing from a green perspective as well. So ISO 15686, um, and that also looks at like economic assessment, but also environmental assessment. Um, and, and architect Lanray spoke about it as well, the embodied cost, because the, you have to cost energy efficiency in design, um, as well as costing it while you're looking at it from a renovation perspective as well. So I think this is a whole topic for a whole nother webinar. So I look forward to um, Green Building Council Nigeria telling all of us when the next one will be, um, because that's <laughs> such a vital, vital topic that we need to talk about to get this across the line. Absolutely. Thank you. Very, um, of course, our time. Let me just quickly have Dr. Briggs um, to make his comment before we um, okay. close for today. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Lawi, many thanks. Dr. Okoye, many thanks. President Waniko, very good afternoon to you. And, um, you know, hello, everyone. 
Now, the, um, just a quick introduction. I'm a private sector architect. I've been that for the past um, 25, 30 years, roughly, internationally, and then now based in Abuja. My role as the chairman of the NI Abuja chapter is CSR. So I'm not part of the Green Building Council because of my role in the NI. No, it's because I'm a professional in the industry. So yes, but I happen to also wear multiple hats. And I would, answer, I would, I would make my comments from you know, different sides. Um, very interestingly, I would like to talk about the granular and the strategic, all right? In here, I hear a lot of conversations that are trying to deal with the granular, but we haven't sorted out the strategic. And what do I mean? You know, listening to what Larry talked about, a lot of what Dubai is building on now runs on the back of data, the existence of data, transparency of data, and the legitimacy of data. We do not have that. We do not have that. GBCN, what I think we should be doing is becoming an advocacy vehicle at policy level where this data exists. I'll give you a simple example. Say back in England, I'm speeding down the M25. I blow a speed camera. In roughly two or three days, a brown envelope will come through my post with my name and the picture of the car saying, listen, you've done this. But OK, just, you know, they're British, so they're very polite. Just in case you're not the one provide who was driving this car in 48 hours. What does that tell you? That tells you that even if I'm living in a farmstead on the outskirts of Manchester, my address is traceable, is trackable. There is a live database of every single asset or development stock. Larry talked about 18,000 buildings, um, sorry, um, high rises. Even in Abuja here, I can tell you for free because as I said, my CSR rule puts me in, in line of fire of a lot of information. We do not have the data of existing stock. You know, Dr. Okoye was talking about the fact that, um, you know, retrofit, um, you know, he would set some do retrofitting and all that. In my view, you've got new stock of buildings, you've got existing stock. A lot of the harm we're doing to our environment is not necessarily from new stock of buildings. I would be hard pressed to say it is from. I think it's from existing stock. And we do not have a database that captures the existing stock. So with all due respect, we don't have a baseline from which we're trying to work from. We don't even know, we haven't even clearly estimated or articulated what the problem we're trying to resolve is. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's good to have these conversations, but it's also better to understand the scope of what we're trying to do. The reason why that is important, I'd like to add again, is that in the absence of state commitment, the burden of adoption is very high on the, pop, on, on the populace. The, in the absence of state, or should I say polity commitment, the burden of adoption is viciously high on the populace. I love the, um, you know, the examples that we was given, you know, in Dubai, that is a state, sorry, that's an example of a state that has consistently over the course of time built line upon line, precept upon precept, and you have a groundswell of corporate governance on which these systems can now be proposed and not just proposed, but happen or work. He showed you that dashboard where he was able to say, um, he was able to drill down his, his habits, you know, consumption, utility consumption habits and see whether he's performing well or otherwise. You cannot do that. That doesn't happen in, in free space. It happens based on the, you know, the aggregate, the, the, com the aggregate behavior of a system over time. In Nigeria, I mean, I've, I've been here, although not too long, but in the brief while I've been here, I can see that we are not yet there. So, you know, I, the last speaker, I think Mr. Um, Dr. Balogun talked about costs. Now, in my view, cost is actually looking at the whole thing at a very granular level. And I'll go back again to what I said at the beginning, the strategic and the granular. At the strategic, we need to start looking at what the SDGs are saying. And we need to start looking at how is the GBCN following, uh, you know, aligning itself with those SDG aspirations. Of course, to solidify that, we have to now start becoming a policy and advocacy vehicle or voice, as it were. One we also have to ensure that ground up baseline data is available. As I said, we do not know, we have no data. And here I am speaking from the nation's capital to say that 
with, to say something which sounds very incriminating, it's a painful reality. I know it's also the same in Lagos. I know that Larry and I schooled in Lagos together, so he knows exactly where I'm coming from. So, so we have to start looking at that. Then when we now come to the granular, we then start thinking about design issues, construction issues, operation and life cycle issues, which is where the stuff um, Dr. Balogun was talking about, like costs start to fall in. But we must be careful not to mix both of them because we run the risk of losing the essence of, because, you know, as Larry said, we don't have a planet B, or oh, sorry, don't, we don't have a plan B. I say we don't have a planet B. This is the only place. So we have no choice but to start thinking about these things. However, if we don't start from somewhere, an established baseline, I have a friend who says in the absence of a target, anything is bull size, anything. So we just, you know, we just assume that we've, we've achieved when we haven't even started. So something as simple as knowing, I mean, I live in an estate here. This is just out of my personal, you know, appetites and behavior. I have now used Google to create a local map of my estate to identify all the buildings. But I know that that sort of a document doesn't exist with the facilities managers or any one of my neighbors on the street. But that's because I want to have an idea so I know what to think or how to think. So we have to start with a, a, an established baseline. If not, we are just setting targets after targets in Zoom meetings, after Zoom meetings, in panels after panels, in GBCNs after GBCNs. But um, sorry, I've gone around many things. I, I hope, I hope that makes um, sense. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Uh, wow. Yes, absolutely, sir. It's, it's a great one. Your comment is quite, um, it's quite piercing. And I think we are in this vehicle together. And one of the key things that drive uh, most of us on board this GPCN are the things you have mentioned. That Of course, we, we know at the moment we don't have state commitment. And of course, we know that without state commitment, the burden of execution is fairly uncertain. And of course, we know that even before you start talking about the state, some of us that are also here have um, like a stake in the state legislative system. So our commitment over the next 18 months to 24 months is to come up in collaboration with other stakeholders with a policy framework that can be recommended for government. Of course, even that we ourselves can spearhead its execution. Of course, we also believe that it won't always be the way it is now. But when we have a change of leadership that recognizes and see the possibilities and the need for this intervention, do we have persons, do we have roadmap, do we have um, blueprints that can be adapted or adopted? I'm sure that's why we are doing what we are doing, not to say we are looking at the Nigeria now, but to say we are looking at the Nigeria that is possible, the Nigeria of the future. Because I'm certain in days to come, we have leaders that are ready to drive this conversation. And for us as a as an enthusiast for us as a body, we know by then it will be too late to start preparing some of this conversation. So we are where we are now because someone didn't prepare in the last 10 years. So um, while this um, is not um, part of this conversation, I would 